All right, so my name is Denise Bale. I'm from the University of Washington. Uh, as Phil mentioned earlier, Bruce Robinson has done a lot of work on making theory predict macroscopic systems, and he's actually done some great advances in terms of the microscopic aspect as well. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about the dielectric dependence of molecular hyperpolarizabilities. So first, let's consider what hyperpolarizability is. Essentially, it's the charge transferability of a molecule, shown here, for instance, for dispersed red 1. And it's related to the overall molecular polarization. It's really the asymmetric response of this molecule that gives rise to the nonlinear terms, the higher order terms, as shown here for, for instance, beta, what we call the first order hyperpolarizability. <laughs> A lot of effort in the past has been focused on increasing hyperpolarizability, and that's because theory predicts that uh, basically due to this electro-optic coefficient, you can directly increase hyperpolarizability, you're directly going to increase your electro-optic activity. Of course, it's not that simple, but that's been the main drive for increasing and understanding hyperpolarizability. The approach that's been done is what we call theory-guided synthesis. So we theor theoretically predict uh, hyperpolarizabilities, and hopefully, depending on the system and the outcome, they're synthetically possible to make the systems that are better from that guidance. Uh, we then, of course, need to measure those molecules to predict, or I should say, uh, be able to determine their hyperpolarizabilities. The problem really relates to comparing theory and measurement. And so one of the questions that comes up that you can see isn't actually discussed here is what happens when you consider solvent effects. Typically the systems for your measured values are <laughs> extrapolated back to zero frequency. So you calculate these at zero frequency, measure them at a specific frequency, extrapolate your experimental values back to zero frequency. You can see how a lot of issues can have possibly come up from this. So there's a gap that exists between your theoretically predicted values and those that are actually experimentally measured. When you consider more complex modern chromophores, this gap becomes even larger. And really what we would like to do is bridge that gap to make theory and measurement agree by understanding, or I should say getting a better understanding, of uh, the frequency and also dielectric dependence of hyperpolarizability. We should first consider, of course, previous models and studies that have been done on this. The two-state model is one of the uh, most popular methods for extrapolating your measured values back to zero frequency. And also from that, you can consider, due to the different degrees of charge separation um, experienced in a molecule, as you change solvent polarity, gives rise to a difference in terms of the bond length alternation. The two-state model is shown here. Um, Another thing that has typically been done is in terms of understanding through Onsager's theory, uh, solvent reaction fields. Typically these two models work for simple molecules such as paranitroaniline as shown here. This has been studied extensively, but this molecule has a small dipole moment. It's relatively insensitive to changes in solvent polarity. So the question we really wanted to ask is, or I should say answer, is in terms of the modern systems, more complex systems, higher dipole moments, uh, more affected by solvent environment, how do they actually respond in terms of these two models? Well, first, let's go ahead and talk about how we measure hyperpolarizability. Typically, this is done most direct way with hyper-Rayleigh scattering. In this case, we have a high, we use an intense uh, laser field going through a solution, chromophore solution, generating uh, incoherently scattered second harmonic, your hyper-Rayleigh scattering. From this, we can directly extract the hyperpolarizability from that second harmonic. Specifically for these measurements, we're using <coughs> 1.9 microns. Um, focus down onto our sample shown here. Through that, we generate the second harmonic scatter, collect it uh, through some detection optics into a monochromator and also a charge coupled uh, camera. This allows us to obtain overall spectrum of our hyper scattering. <coughs> From that spectrum, we obtain the intensities. 
Thankfully, there's a direct relationship between your reference spectrum, or I should say your reference intensity, to that of your unknown hyperpolarizability. So we can extract the hyperpolarizability for our specific samples. In this case, we looked at YLD-156 and CLD-1, as shown here, in several different solvents with a wide range of dielectric constants. In regards to theory, a few different models were used using density functional theory, Gaussian 03 and Gaussian 09. The main thing is that we applied the solvent reaction field using the PCM model. And then also, looking at different functional and basis sets, really try to investigate how the previous two-state model analysis relates to modern techniques. In the first case, the geometries were fixed in vacuum and then applied a dielectric, uh, I should say the PCM model, to predict their behavior as a function of dielectric. Second scenario, we actually looked at the individual geometries in response to each individual solvent and then predicted the hyperpolarizability as a function of that solvent. And then lastly, basically uh, from this, we were actually able to obtain the transition energies as well as the transition dipole moments. Ultimately, what we want to do is be able to directly measure or I should say directly compare measured values to that that are theoretically predicted. Well, measured values, of course, have a dielectric dependence and also a frequency dependence. So what you see here is just that. You have calculated values showing the black as a function of your dielectric and your uh, hyperpolarizability. Measured values are all the colored points up there for the two systems. Important thing to note here is that no manipulation is actually done to the experimental values. So you're taking theory at a specific dielectric environment, solvent environment, and also at a specific frequency and relating the two. If you compare the new methods versus that of the old, you actually can see for the old um, or I should say the last slide, we're looking at this data set here. So with the different theory predictions, what you have is the two-state model rolls off. You have the different functional and basis sets in terms of uh, optimized per solvent or in vacuum. For a complex system, something, of course, a little bit higher dipole moment, more influence from solvents such as YLD-156, it is much better fit by the two other sets. And so what really happens is that for these small, simple molecules, something like the two-state model is able to predict it, but for our new modern systems, uh, the new theory holds better response. So with that, we can kind of just uh, have an overall cap of summaries. The first challenge, of course, was to be able to establish the dependence of the hyperpolarizability on the dielectric, specifically measuring that. It's a little challenge. And then, of course, there's a whole other world of challenge in terms of the optimizing the computational methods to really be able to predict hyperpolarizabilities at a given frequency at a certain dielectric and have them match with what you measure. Of course, we're not out of the, I guess you could say, clear yet. There's definitely so, uh, some discrepancies that occur. One of the major challenges with that is, of course, determining absolute hyperpolarizability. You're always referencing back to uh, some hyperpolarizability of a known chromophore or solvent. But those values for the absolute um, hyperpolarizabilities, there's still a little ambiguity there, so it needs to definitely be looked into. With that, I'd like to acknowledge several people here, the theory team, experiment team, of course the Dalton and Reed groups, and ask if there are any questions.